you would be taking out your Bibles and turning to the 13th chapter of the book of Mark, Mark chapter 13, we'll begin there in just a moment. It is good to see everyone out this evening, and I encourage you as we study along to follow along and test the things I have to say to see that they are by the Word of God. And if we find it to be the truth, I hope that we can take and apply it in our everyday walks of life, that we can be better servants of God in the future than we have in the past. In Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 33, it says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of God, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowning of the rooster, or in the morning, lest, coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Well, in the context here of Mark chapter 13, and in the statement made in verse 37, when Jesus says, I say to you, what I say to you, I say to all, watch, he's dealing with the second coming. He talks about that of that day and hour no one knows. The parallel account would be recorded for us over in Matthew chapter 24. But you know, there's an interesting statement that Jesus makes in verse 33, in verse 34, 35, and in verse 37. It's one word. He simply says in each of those, to watch. Now in this context, he's talking about watching for the returning of the Son of Man. Watch for the day that he's going to come in judgment. Be prepared for that day. But you know, the word watch is used in several ways throughout the Scripture and referring to several different things. Again, in this context, watch for the, uh, for the coming of the Son of Man. We need to be watchful when it comes to our adversary, the devil. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking someone whom he may devour. The idea there is of being awake and alert. But you see, there are other things that the Scripture will point out that we need to watch. And I want us to think this evening about that word watch and five things in Scriptures that it points out we are to watch. You see, these five things we need to watch because eventually the Lord is going to return. We need to watch for that coming, as Mark 13, 37 said. We need to watch out because our adversary is walking about and he's going to seek to find some way to make us trip up and to do what he would have us to do and to fall away from serving God. But here are five specific things this evening that we need to, according to the Scriptures, watch. We need to keep our eye on and guard to make sure that we are doing what is right in the eyes of God. The first thing that we are told in Scriptures, that we, or one of the first things we're told in Scriptures we need to watch, and the first we want to explore this evening, is we need to watch our words. You see, the hardest thing for us to control is the tongue. Look at James chapter 3 with me. In James chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, James 3, beginning at verse 1, James says, brethren, My brethren... Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. You see, it's very easy for us, if we're not careful, if we're not watchful, to sin with the tongue. It is the hardest thing for us to learn to control. So therefore, we must watch what we say. You know, one of the reasons that it's, it's hardest for us to control the tongue, and the reason we need to be very diligent and very watchful of the things we say, is because there are so many ways in which we can sin with the tongue. There are so many ways in which we could sin with the tongue. It's not like we can sit back and say, okay, here's this one area in which I could sin with the tongue, and so I need to watch out and make sure that I'm not doing this thing right here. But instead, there are so many ways we could sin. For example, we cannot curse our fellow man with our tongue. You still open to James chapter 3? Pick up at verse 3. 
Indeed, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So as he's going through this text here, James is saying in the early part, you've got to be watchful of your tongue. Your tongue is like a fire in verse 6. And the use of the tongue as a fire is a fitting illustration because, and we'll talk about this later on, it can be used for much good like a fire can. It's starting to get cold outside. We're getting close to winter time. You may, you, you may have a fireplace and you set a fire in it to keep you warm. As long as that's contained, that's good. But the reason that a fire is also a fitting illustration is when improperly used, it can cause great damage. You think about all the forest fires and wildfires you see when you turn on the news. It seems like, it's, and especially during the summer, spring and summertime, you can't help but turn on the, loo- the news that it seems like somewhere like California's got another wildfire going. And you think of all the, the damage that those cause. Because that's a fire that's not contained. And the fire is not contained when we do things like in verse 9, bless God, yet we turn around with the same tongue we're blessing God, and we turn over here and we curse our fellow man. So we need to watch our tongue lest we are cursing our fellow man. Oh, it doesn't matter that we're over here praising God. It doesn't matter that we're over here blessing God. But, but as long as we're over here cursing our fellow man, this doesn't do us any good. A spring can't bring forth both fresh and salt water. A fig tree can't bear olives, and a grapevine can't bear figs. So our mouth, our our tongues cannot bless God and curse our fellow man. So we've got to make sure we're not speaking ill and cursing our fellow man. But you know, it would be easy if that was as simple as far as it went. We need to control your tongue. Watch your tongue not to curse your fellow man. It would be a lot easier if that's where it stopped. But not only do we have to watch out to make sure we're not cursing our fellow man, we need to realize we're going to give an account for the idle words that we speak. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 36. In Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 36, Jesus says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So again, I gave account for the idle words. Those words were just sort of said with empty meaning. Those words that we were just sort of, we, we were just sort of throwing around. That we were saying and they, the, as if we had no care for what they really meant. The words we kind of used to maybe substitute for some other things. An idle talk. Really empty talk. But you see, the kind of things we're saying, these kind of things that we may just go out and say, and and we don't think a thing about, but they're idle words, and we may think that it's no big deal, but Jesus says we're going to give an account for those. But again, it would be a lot easier to control the tongue if it stopped there, but it doesn't. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, We give an account for the vain babblings that are said. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 16. It says, But shun profane and idle babblings, 
for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer, hymenase, and philetus are of this sort. This idle babbling, this vain babbling, again, the kind of things that people are saying a whole lot, but not really saying anything. Avoid those kind of things. Those are the kinds of things that, that Paul tells Timothy you've got to shun. So you see, you're beginning to see why it's hard for us to realize we've got to, to keep control of the tongue. We can curse our fellow man. Or the use of idle words or vain babblings. Or the use of corrupt words. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 29... It says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is, is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. There needs to be no corrupt words proceeding from our mouth. Look just in the next chapter over, in chapter 5 and in verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but the giving of thanks. I want you to think about the things that are listed here. He talks about corrupt words. In, ch in chapter 5 and verse 4, he talks about foolish talking or coarse jesting. Some translations, they would talk about crude joking. The kind of things you think that's a joke and it's not really harmful, but you're making these kind of jokes that are, would be a dirty joke and these kind of jokes that you think there's not really any harm in. Guess what? There is. These are things which are not fitting. Not only that, we can sin by lying. Revelation 21 and in verse 8. In Revelation 21, in that description of heaven given there, verse 8 talks about those that are not in heaven. And right alongside the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and the sexually immoral and the sorcerers and idolaters. Let me tell you, when we list some sins that we think are some pretty big sins, those sins would be right there. And the very next one says, and all liars. People talk about, well, it's just, a, it's just a little white lie. It's no big deal. The Lord thought so. Revelation 21 said that all liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's as serious a sin as the one that's guilty of murder. It's as serious a sin as the one that's guilty of idolatry. It's as serious as a sin as the one is guilty of sexual immorality. So we need to watch our tongue. We can't let these kind of things proceed from our mouth. We can't be the kind of person that, that curses our brother or uses idle words or vain babblings or corrupt words or lies. You see, that's the dangerous side of the fire of the tongue. But instead, we need to use words fitly spoken. Turn to Proverbs 25 and verse 11. In Proverbs chapter 25, Proverbs 25 and in verse 11. But words, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. We need to be careful what we're saying. These need to be the kind of things that we're, we're, we're conscientious of, we're very careful. We need to be thinking before we speak. Let me tell you, a word fitly spoken is more than just simply saying the right thing. A word fitly spoken is saying the right thing with the right attitude. It's saying the right thing with the right attitude at the right time. You see, what we have to realize is that we can sin with our tongue so many ways. Maybe, just maybe, I'm saying the right thing, but I'm saying it in the wrong way. That's not a word fitly spoken. Maybe I'm saying the right thing and I'm saying it with the right kind of attitude, but I use poor judgment in the time that I'm saying it. That's not fit, word fitly spoken. Sometimes it's better not to say it then and wait till another time. But you see, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. We need to make sure that we're being very conscientious and very careful. We're watching our words to make sure they're words fitly spoken. To make sure it's the kind of speech that is seasoned with salt. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, Colossians 4, 6. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. You see, we need to be careful with our words because we can say that we can easily sin with the tongue in so many ways. And, and in more ways than we've even talked about this evening. That we could just spend an entire evening, we could spend a whole series of lessons just talking about sins of the tongue. 
We need to realize we've got to watch our words. We've got to make sure that we're not the kind of person using that vain talk, that idle words. We're not the kind of person that's making the crude or the coarse jokes or the coarse jesting. But instead, we're using words fitly spoken. And our speech is seasoned with salt. We're making sure we're saying the right things. And we're making sure we're avoiding the things the Lord has said not to say. Do you know how we do that? We watch our words. We think before we speak. We make sure that what we're saying is what ought to be said. And we're watching very carefully. We're very diligent to make sure that we're doing what is pleasing in the eyes of God. So we need to watch our words. The tongue is the hardest thing to control, and so we need to watch it. But not only do we need to watch our words, we need to watch our actions. You see, eventually we're all going to give an account for what we have done. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We were there just a few weeks ago, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So you see, receive an account for the things that are done in the body, for whatever has been done, whether good or bad. That is, we're going to give an account for our actions. And so what we've got to make sure is we're being careful and watchful that our actions are that which are in keeping with the will of God. You see, we can't let our actions be the works of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul writing beginning at verse 19 talks about these works of the flesh. And beginning at verse 19 he said, Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, we need to watch what we're doing. We can't let our actions be these works of the flesh. We can't let our actions be the kinds of actions that the world would be taking. We can't let it be the things such as these, because those that practice such things, those that do these things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the first question we need to ask ourselves when it comes to our actions is, is this in violation of the Word of God? If it is... We need to tell ourselves we cannot do it. We need to be watchful, be alert, make sure our actions are in keeping with the will of God. In fact, instead of us doing these works of the flesh, we instead need to be doing good works, for it's that to which we were created. In Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 10, it said, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you see, we can't let our actions be these works of the flesh. We can't let our actions be the kinds of things the world partakes in. But it needs to be these good works, the works for which we were created in Christ Jesus to do. That's the kind of action we need to be doing. That's the kind of action we need to take, is doing these good works. Doing what God has said in His will we ought to do and not doing what God has said in His will we ought not to do. We need to watch our actions. We need to watch. What do we need to watch? We need to watch our words. Tongue is the, is the hardest thing to control, and we need to be careful that we control it. We need to control our actions. We need to control the things we do, make sure it's not the things of the world, but the things that God would have us to do. But not only do we need to control our actions, we need to control our thoughts. You see, it, one would not dispute the fact that actions are something we'll give an account for. What, well, actions are something that we all realize, okay, we're going to give an account for the things that we have done. Now, if we're not careful, we can, may live in such a way that that's not, as though that's not, we're not practicing that we know that principle. But we understand we're going to give an account for what we do. But you see, we're also going to give an account for our thoughts. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 with me. Hebrews chapter 4. 
Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 11, it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Now stop right there for just a second. Just back up and see the context. The context of Hebrews chapter 4, he's talking about the people of Israel. They, that they had gone into the land of rest. They had gone into this promised land, but they had not received final rest because, as he points out previously, that if Joshua had given them rest, there would not have afterward uh, have spoken of another day. So verse 9, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So in using the example of Israel, it says Israel didn't obey chapter 3, but in chapter 4 they've entered into the promised land, but realize the rest they received is not final rest. There remains therefore, verse 9, a rest for the people of God. So you therefore, verse 11, be diligent to enter that rest. Lest you fall by the same example of disobedience. Lest you do what Israel did when they came to the door of the promised land, having seen the works of God and rejected them. Now, verse 12, here's why, in being diligent, you need to realize this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner, listen, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. See, the people of Israel physically rebelled. They were there and they said, we will not enter into this rest. That we cannot overtake these giants. We've got to be diligent to enter our rest and realize that the Word of God is living and powerful and that it can pierce even to the division of soul and spirit. And what's going to be laid open and laid bare is not just the things that we've done, like 2 Corinthians 5 points out, but even the things that we thought. And the intents of our heart, they're all going to be laid open and bare. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, we need to be careful what we think. We need to control our thoughts. We need to make sure that we're thinking on the kinds of things that we need to. You see, oftentimes when we look at a list of sins, go ahead and be turning to Romans 1. In verse 29 with me. When we look at a list of what we consider the, the grievous or the most heinous of sins, we think about a couple of those real easy and right off the bat. And they're typically things that are done. We think of murder and stealing and adultery and fornication and those, those kinds of sins. The kind of sins that are, that are sins of action and not just thought. But I want you to think about this for just a second. I want you to think about Romans chapter 1. And it's on the board before us. And notice the kind of sins that are sins of thought. Look what he says. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual morality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Now here's this long list of sins. And you look at this long list of sins here and you think, okay, here are all these sins and the kinds of sins that we, we ought not to be committing. In the, and God has said, don't do these things. And, and there's the murderer and there's the, the sexually immoral and all that. Eleven. Eleven of the sins of Romans chapter 1, 29 through 31 are sins of thought. Listen to the list again. Covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, evil-mindedness, haters of God, proud, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. All of those are sins in thought. Now you may see the results of those sins. You may be able to see the results of those sins of thought in the way that one carries out their actions. But those are sins that first and foremost were committed in thought. You know what that tells me? I need to be careful what I'm thinking. 
I need to be careful what is crossing my mind and what I'm thinking and the intents of my heart because I'm going to give an account for the things I thought just like I give an account for the things I've done. You see, what we need to realize is Jesus knows our thoughts. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 17 it said, But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. Here's what they're thinking in their minds in Luke chapter 11. They never said it, they did it out loud, but Jesus knew their thoughts. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 2 with me, and I want you to think about this story for just a second. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus has healed a man here in Mark chapter 2, and and here are the scribes and the Pharisees, here are the leaders of the day, as Jesus has healed this paralytic. And he's turned to them in verse 5 and said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Look at verse 6. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning. You underline in your Bible, you might want to underline this. Reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, again, you might want to underline this. When Jesus perceived in his spirit what they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things? I underline this again. In your hearts. The scribes are standing there off to the distance and turning to each other and saying, well, I thought only God had the power to forgive sins. And another one turns back and said, I thought the same thing. And then Jesus answers them. But these were the things they were reasoning in their hearts. These were the things he perceived were in them. You see, Jesus knew their thoughts. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And God knows what we're thinking. And we're ultimately going to give an account of that, as Hebrews 4 would point out. So we must bring every thought captive. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty in God for putting down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the obedience of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know what the weapons of our warfare do? Well, they're not like these regular weapons of warfare. The warfare, the weapons of warfare of this world, they're the kind of things that are not carnal, but instead they cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against God and bring every thought into captivity. We need to be spending time in the Word of God and bringing our thoughts into captivity. We could say, as Philippians 4 says, that we need to focus or meditate on good things. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Focus on the good things. Meditate on them. Make those the things you fill your mind with. Not the things of this world. Not the things that can drag you down. But focus on these good things. Focus and meditate on these things. So you see, we need to make sure that we're watching our words. Because we're going to give an account for what we've said. Even the out of words we spoke, as Mark 12 would mention. Or Matthew 12, rather, would mention. We need to watch our words, it's the hardest thing to control. We need to watch our actions. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the things done in the body. We're giving an account for our actions. We need to watch our thoughts because every thought will be laid open, naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. We also must watch our company. You see, those we associate with will influence us. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, under the context of 1 Corinthians 15, 33, is dealing with false teachers, but that principle applies elsewhere, and that is those that we associate with will impact us. They will influence us. You see, Ammon was somebody, or was influenced by those he was around. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 13 with me. 2 Samuel 13. After this, beginning at verse 1, Absalom the son of David had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon the son of David loved her. And Amnon was so distressed over his sister that he became sick, for, he was, for she was a virgin. 
And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. Now listen to verse 3. I'm going to talk about sad statements of the Bible. There are a lot of sad statements in the Bible. This to me is a sad one because what should be a good thing is not. And that is Amnon had a friend. Now, what should happen is Amnon should have a good friend who turns to him and encourages him to do the right thing. But instead, Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, and he was a very crafty man. And then Jonadab perceives this scheme, and here's what you need to do, Amnon. In verse 14, Amnon does exactly that. And as Tamar was pleading with him, it said he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. You see, Amnon, if he'd have had the right kind of friends, would have had somebody that would have turned to him and given him good advice. But instead he had a friend who who perceives this scheme up and tells Amnon what he should do. And Amnon listens to that. He's impacted by the one he is around who gave him this plan. You see, Peter was impacted by those he was around. In Matthew chapter 26, 69 through 75, we have Peter denying our Lord. But it's in verse 69 that he sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, You were with Jesus of Galilee. And we know the rest of the story, how he denies that, and then they'll come to him again at the gateway. He's gone out to the gateway, and they say, this fellow is with Jesus, and he denies it with an oath. And then later they come to him again and said, surely you are one of them, your speech betrays you. But he begins to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. That's when the rooster crows, and he remembered the words of Jesus, who said to him before, the rooster crows three times, you, or before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But you see... Just mere hours earlier. This is the same Peter that sitting in the upper room with the other apostles says, Not me, Lord. When the Lord says, You're all going to be scattered. Not me, Lord. All these others may, but not me. I'm ready to die with you. I tell you, that's a lot easier thing to say when you're among the other apostles. But on the night of the Lord's betrayal, he sat in the courtyard with the Lord's enemies. Tell me as he looked around and he sees no friendly face. As he looks around and he sees those who are putting the Lord to death, it didn't become hard for him to take a stand then as he sees nobody willing to stand with him. You see, Peter was impacted by those around him. And it's because of these principles that Solomon warns his son that he needs to watch his company. My son, Proverbs 1.10, If sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. That's 10 through 14. Here's what Solomon said in verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. What Solomon is telling his son here is, Son, you avoid these kind of people. You be careful who you associate with. What he's telling him is, Son, you watch your company. Because you see, bad friends can be a snare to our soul. Turn to Proverbs 22 with me. Proverbs chapter 22. Verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. You know why you don't make friendship with an angry man? You know why you don't go with a furious man? Because you're going to learn his ways, and what you've done is set a snare for your soul by making that man your friend in the first place. By putting yourself in that situation to be impacted by those around you, to be influenced by your company. So watch who you're around. Watch who you associate with. So we need to watch our company. Because we may think we're strong. We may think that we'll be fine. We we, we can handle it. But remember this. You will be impacted by those around you eventually. If you begin to think you're strong enough that you will have no problem, that's when you need to watch out. Let him who thinks he stand, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 13. Let him who thinks he stand take heed that he does not fall. 
It's when we think that we're strong. It's when we think we're going to stand. That's when we realize that we are not as strong as we thought we were. We need to watch our company. Watch your words, watch your action, watch your thought, watch your company, and finally, watch your heart. This is really the foundation of all of it. In Proverbs 4.23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. All the issues of life, all the things that we can think of, everything else that we've really talked about comes back to this. A couple of weeks ago we talked about spiritual heart disease and realized that really it's in the heart that everything else began. So we need to realize that, that all these issues are flowing out of our heart. All these issues come from the heart. And so we sit here this evening and we're asking ourselves, what do I need to do? Okay, you tell me I need to watch my words, I need to watch my action, I need to watch my thoughts, I need to watch my company. How do I do that? You do that by keeping your heart. You see, all the other problems can be dealt with when it starts with keeping of the heart. You see our words that we speak. In Matthew 12 and in verse 34 it says, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You want to know somebody, what somebody is inward? Listen to the words they say. Listen to the kinds of things they're speaking. It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So when good things are proceeding, you should realize this person has a good heart. When it's the evil things that are proceeding, when it's the kind of things that God has said ought not to be proceeding out of the mouth, that tells us something about the heart. In Proverbs 16, 29, our actions. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. When we turn to God, the Lord will direct our steps, but what we've got to realize is it's a man's heart that plans his way. And the kind of things that he's going to do are going to come back to the kind of heart that he has. So somebody's faced with a crossroads. What do I need to do? Here's this crossroads. Here I'm being tempted and pulled in the direction of sin. And I know what God's will says. Where do I need to go? Well, you see, it's the kind of things we're putting in our heart that tell us where we need to go. Are we filling it with good things? Are we filling it with the Word of God? Are are, Are we making sure that we're focused on those and meditating on those good things? then what that means is that it's going to result in me doing the right thing. Or am I filling my mind, am I filling my heart with wicked things? Then the action that results is I'm going to give in to sin and temptation because my heart's not strong. And that's where I will find myself. Our thoughts. Matthew 15 and verse 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, Murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, and blasphemies. It was out of the heart that proceed evil thoughts. Well, our heart, it results in what we think. So again, meditate on these good things. You're meditating on those kinds of things, then you're focused on what you need to, and you're focused on what you need to be, you'll be serving God. But if you're not, if you're not, then you'll find yourself doing the kinds of things that you don't want to be doing. You'll find yourself thinking the kinds of things you ought not, having these evil thoughts, filling your thoughts being the kinds of sins we saw in Romans chapter 1. But it comes back to what you're putting in your heart. And it results in our company being what it ought to be. Romans 12, 9 says that we need to uh, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. We abhor what is evil. And when our heart all set on serving God, it abhors evil, and we're tormented by the conduct of the wicked. In 2 Peter 2, 8 and 9, it says, For the righteous, that righteous man, talking about Lot, that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So if our heart's focused on where it needs to be, we're not going to want to associate with those of the world because our heart is abhorring what is evil and we're tormented seeing the wicked go on around us. But you see, if we're not focused on what we need to be, we're not serving God as we need to be, and we're not abhorring evil as we ought to be, then it doesn't really make a difference to us we can associate with those of the world. So what we need to realize is that we therefore must watch. Just as Jesus said we need to watch when it comes for Him to return. 
Just Peter points out that we've got to be sober and vigilant that our adversary the devil is walking about as a roaring lion. We need to be watchful when it comes to ourselves. We need to watch the words that we say, the actions that we take, the thoughts in our mind, the company we keep, and ultimately it all results because we're watching, keeping, and guarding our heart. Jesus said, this I say to you, I say to all, watch. Are we watching the kind of things that the Scriptures point out we need to watch? Are we being diligent to be the kind of people that God would have us to be, to be faithful servants of His and doing His will? Good if we are. We need to keep it up. But it may be as we come to a close of the sermon this evening that there is one or more present who may have never responded in obedience to the gospel. If you're here and you've never responded in obedience to the gospel, but you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, will you not repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism? Take those actions because they're the actions that God said you need to take. Not because I said it, not because the elders said it. Because that's what the Bible says. Watch your actions. And keep those, make, take the action that God would have you do and respond in obedience to the gospel. Maybe you're here and you've done that, but you say somewhere along the line, I've not been as watchful as I need to be. So of a private nature, you can take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it's of a public nature, we will pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. But no matter what your need is, if we could assist you in any way, would you not come for us together we stand as we sing?